Now, the key limitation of this is that of the particles we care about, none of them are dielectric. None of them are purely dielectric. In no case do we have conductivities of zero in the medium. In no case do we have conductivities of zero in uh, the particle. Or, uh, to be more precise, we very, very rarely have such a situation. And in fact, the majority of the dielectrophoretic uh, manipulations we do are not with steady fields, but rather with AC fields. And so what we need to do now is to evaluate what is the force that we get, or what is, the, in particular, what's the time averaged force that we get when we apply an AC field. Any comments or questions so far? Does anyone have any formal request for the blue chalk, which has not been used yet in the lecture? Okay, you have you have a frowny face. Is that because? No, that's green. Just just for contrast, I was just making sure that the frowny face wasn't that you thought I'd done something wrong or that you hated me. Okay. So. At the end of the last lecture, I asserted, without defending it, that we could, in fact, take this relation for dielectrophoresis and we could extend it to the case where the uh, permittivity was non-zero, but also the conductivity was non-zero. And we could also, furthermore, extend it to the case where we have an electric field that is an AC electric field. And at the time, I said all that was required to do that was to replace these epsilon with epsilons with squiggles underneath, take the real part of this expression, and then write this not necessarily as the instantaneous dielectric force, but rather the time average of the dielectric force. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Now. For us to deal with AC fields, we want to now write a phasor representation of, what's, uh, of these applied electric fields to the applied electric displacements, the displacement current, the conductive current, the dipoles, etc. And the basic argument behind this phasor approach is the same as our argument when we were doing hydraulic circuit analysis. You may recall that in hydraulic circuit analysis, we said, all right, if we apply an AC field, we can describe that AC field with a phasor representation. We'll have two different components of the response, the instantaneous response, and then also a delayed response. In the case of hydraulic circuits, we might have applied a sinusoidal pressure, and that sinusoidal would lead to a uh, first a resistive response that was sinusoidal and was in phase with our applied pressure field. But then we also had a capacitive response or a compliant response that was 90 degrees out of phase. And so the idea was, as our pressure was oscillating, we were getting a pressure-driven flow that was given by the hagen poiseuille relation with the hydraulic resistance. But 90 degrees out of phase, we were also getting a response that came from the compliance of the system responding by the pressure expanding and contracting. And that allowed us for hydraulic, uh, a hydraulic circuit analysis, we were able to go from something that looked like this where this was purely real, to something that looked like this, which was complex. And the difference between these two things was that this was a description of the pressure itself, a real quantity. This was a description of the analytic representation of the pressure, which was now complex. This was the volumetric flow. This was the analytic representation of the volumetric flow. This was a real hydraulic resistance. This was a complex resistance that was given by both the hydraulic resistance, but also the hydraulic compliance. And with this, we were able to show that if a channel had a finite compliance, because you had one component that was in phase and another component that was 90 degrees out of phase, you fundamentally had a phase lag of the response. And so we might have a pressure that was oscillating, but we might find that the flow that came out the back end was offset by a phase of 10 degrees, or 20 degrees, or 30 degrees, or 90 degrees. If there was no phase lag, that meant that there was no compliant response. If there was a pure 90 degree phase lag, that meant that there was no resistive response, and all you had was a balloon that was stretching and shrinking. <coughs> and if it was anywhere in between, it means that we had both. 
So we're going to take the same idea here, except that now the instantaneous response is going to be the polarization of the medium, which will be described by the electrical permittivity. So electrical permittivity, as we use it in this class, is an instantaneous response to a field. So if I have some water and I apply an electric field to it, it instantaneously responds by polarizing. So to be precise, it takes 8 picoseconds for that to happen. But as long as we're at frequencies that are slower than that, we'll treat that as instantaneous. So the motion of a, a water molecule, if you think of the ends of my fingers as being the hydrogens and my hand as being the oxygen, when this thing flips back and forth, there's a net motion of charge, there's a net current associated with that. And we call that displacement current. That instantaneous response to the change in the field means that when we apply a field with a specific frequency, there's a displacement current with that frequency that's perfectly in phase with our applied field. At the same time, though, we have ions. And so if we have a conductive medium, these ions will move in response to that field. But they don't respond instantaneously. In fact, the existence of a field doesn't mean that they're polarized, it means that they're moving and in the process of polarizing themselves. So the, the permittive response, the displacement current, is an instantaneous polarization that's always in phase with the field. In contrast, our current is something where the change in the polarization is in phase with the field. And so you have a case where you have two different responses, one which is effectively the derivative of each other, of, of the other, and in the case of a sine wave, if you take the derivative, you get something that's 90 degrees out of phase. OK, so mathematically, how does this work out? <clears throat> Rather than saying that we have a constant electric field, we're going to say that we have a sinusoidally varying electric field. And so I'll describe that as E naught cosine omega t. In terms of notation, I'm going to say I'm going to have an analytic representation of that. The, and that analytic representation will be complex. I'll denote the fact that it's complex by having a tilde underneath it. Now I'm going to say that that's E naught times exponential j omega t. If I take the real part of this, I get this back. right? And going back and forth between this, the real physical thing, and this, a mathematical construct that helps me analyze the physical thing, is reasonable because at the moment I'm using linear equations. For everything about this system that's linear, going back and forth between these works very well. As soon as it goes nonlinear, I'm in trouble. <coughs> Now I have a, a phaser, and this phaser basically comes from the argument that if everything is oscillating at omega t, everything will have an exponential j omega t at the end. And I can write an equation where every term has exponential j omega t at the end, or I can just drop them all and the equations all become the same. So this is the real quantity, the analytic representation, the phaser representation. In this case, the phaser representation contains both the magnitude of the response and the phase lag with reference to some reference signal. I decided that I was going to create all of this action with an electric field. And so the electric field, by definition, has no phase lag. So the phaser for the electric field is real. So that's my electric field. If I want to measure the electric displacement, I can say that the electric displacement is also, uh, also cyclic with frequency omega. So I can write it as d naught cosine omega t. I'm assuming that it's an instantaneous response. So I'm basically just saying that d is equal to epsilon times e. So I get this relation. My analytic representation for the electric displacement is given by, oh boy. is given by epsilon e naught exponential j omega t. And my phaser representation is just epsilon times e naught. Again, because the electric displacement is a measure of the permittive response, and because I'm assuming that it's instantaneous, it's real. There's no phase lag here.
I can also talk about the current. So the only current I expect to see is the conductivity times the electric field. I can write that as sigma epsilon naught times cosine omega t. I can say that the analytic representation of that has an exponential omega t, and uh, that phasor response is just sigma times epsilon naught. Sorry, uh, I, as written, is the current density. So it's the current per unit area. And we need to be careful to distinguish. I'm using J as the square root of minus 1. And I'm using I as a current density. And all these things, uh, in general, are vectors. And so I could put vector harpoons on all of those, although I didn't uh, as I wrote them up here. <coughs> 